everybody. Hello. Welcome. Our next to last class, uh, but uh, one of the more important classes today because uh, this evening you'll get the full history of Appalachian State's relationship with China. Um, you may not, you may or may not be aware that uh, although the Holland Fellows Program has had our relationship with Fudan for almost 20 years now, uh, our initial relationship with China was with the Northeastern University in Shenyang. And that relationship was established by our two um, speakers this evening, John Thomas and Harvey Durham, back in the 1980s, uh, with the help of Marv Williamson, who spoke with, to us uh, earlier in the semester. So they got that initial relationship going with China at a time when uh, not many other universities or even organizations were establishing relationships with China. So we were on the ground early and have kept that relationship going in one form or another. And so we're going to get the full history of our uh, China exchanges uh, from uh, John and Harvey this evening. Uh, so it's always a pleasure to have them here back on campus. Um, and uh, we always have to time it when they're both back on the mountain because they're not necessarily in uh, Boone full time. Uh, but when, whenever they are here in the region, we want, definitely want to have them come speak to the class and the Holland Fellows. And hopefully you'll uh, recognize some of the significance of the role that you play uh, in our ongoing China relationship. So John Thomas, and Dr. welcome. Dr. Henson always punches the buttons for oh. me here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. I will try. I'll try to keep up. He, he, she does. She keeps me out of trouble. <laughs> Listen. And you probably wonder why, I was talking to Jennifer just a while ago, probably wonder why um, the dates that I'm going to tell you to uh, give like 18 years with this, specifically about 18 years. I took the first crowd of this crowd to China in 1996. And uh, the, key, the key with Northeast University, which I assume some of you have know anything about Northeast. You too. That goes back to 1981. Don, as well. Who, who is it? Uh, Don, Clay, and Ben. Great. Uh, did a study of so you've been in Shenyang. Yeah. I didn't know you were in Northeast. I went to other cities. So. Oh, Clay. Yeah. Uh, well, I explained to help you to understand why two old men would come here and talk to you about something 35 years old. Uh, it's it's something is. Told that we've had the privilege, really the privilege, of following this program, your program, as it's developed. And believe me, it's developed, as you'll find out tonight. The real Dr. Durham was the vice chancellor for academic affairs back when the earth was still cooling, and I was chancellor. And uh, we together worked for about almost 20 years together in Port China. <coughs> This thing. After even after I retired, uh, Dr. Durham stayed on, and he has literally taken care of all all of our international programs. We've gone, gone over there, Italy, and you know, all the other places that we have. So he knows what he's talking about. But for a bit here, I'd like to just go back and walk you through some stuff here. The first part of this lesson tonight is going to be me going back over some letters that we started back in, in the 1980s. And uh, we'll get out of that quickly, and then Dr. Durham will have some show and tell here that is going to be of interest. But it, it is as current as today, with the problems that you all have, and if you haven't had them yet, you will have them, in dealing with people. One thing you've learned in this time you've been in this, the Chinese particularly, have placed great respect and great uh, uh, emphasis on personal respect. To, and, and when you want, if you want to get something done there, you've got to know. And Jennifer's been over there enough to know if you, you get into a discussion or something, you can go to this lady and say, how would you handle this? And she'll help you. And I think you pick up some of it from either from his discussions or 
from the, the letters. The letters, I put them in here because I, I asked the archivists when we started this, this has been almost 20 years ago, we started to pull this thing together. And even 20 years ago, I said, my memory, I don't want to do something this important. Make a long story short, she pulled it all up for me. And, and part of this stuff here is, is right from the original documents. And why go back to them? Give me the next one. Oh, before I do, let me oh. the cast of characters here. That's me, Harvey. You already met Marv. The next one they threw in there. That's me 20, 40 years ago. We'll get to the next one. <laughs> 20 years ago, when we first started this dog and pony show, uh, Schoenfeld put that up there. And he said, I just wanted to show up when you had hair. <laughs> Made me feel good. Click on to the next one. If you would. Now, this map, uh, click to the next map. I think the next one's better. This is a good map uh, of <clears throat> China for, for this little talk. Because we'll tell you that we entered China way back here that, from Hong Kong through Guangzhou and Beijing and then, then up to Xinjiang. And as Harvey talks to you, you'll understand our proximity to North Korea, right on the border of North Korea and Xinjiang, which will help you understand why he ran into so much military stuff when we got there. Uh, as he pointed out to me just a moment ago, this is the first program that went into China after the normalization. President Nixon opened China in 1974, and he did some work over there. And then we got, this starts, starts our part of it. We got a, a letter, we got a telephone call from uh, Hong Kong. A professor from the Walker College of Business had gotten a job. Hong Kong Technical Institute. Now again, this is 1980, 35 years ago. He'd gotten a job over there. And he called, I was chancellor, and I'd been chancellor just a matter of months. He called and said, uh, Chancellor, would you like to open an exchange agreement with the university here in either China or Hong Kong? And being on the job just a few months, I said, sure. It's like I had the authority to do all this. I said, sure, we'll, we'll do it. And uh, it didn't take me a minute when I went down to see the vice chancellor <coughs> and said, I kind of committed this. And he said, uh, Chancellor, he said, John, John, you can't really make this kind of decision based on a telephone call. He said, uh, oh, we need to get some. Make a long story short, I called back, we got a telegram. So this next thing, if you would put it up. Now, I know you can read, but I'm going to do a voiceover here because it keeps us together. Okay? I'm just going to walk us through here. This is the proposed exchange program, beginning with a telegram from Dr. Donaldson Woods last May, in which he initiated the subject of a possible exchange program with the university or universities in Hong Kong and or the People's Republic of China. We have corresponded, and he has further defined his proposals in memorandum dated June 24 and June 26. And if you'll notice this, this is a memorandum from me to, uh, to the faculty. This is trying to get this out. I get it to him, and believe me, this was before the days of uh, the email and stuff. This, paperwork began to grind here to get everybody involved. And you'll notice the date, August 4. This is, we've been working on this for a long time. Uh, May, June, July, August, and early before May. But anyway, we've been working on it a long time. One reason for this, <coughs> ladies and gentlemen, is this, that uh, to come to a, as you're going to find when you go in your first job at MRD, there's a concept of resistance to change. You've heard that? Resistance to change is a negative way of putting it. It's um, acceptance or uh, of change is a positive way. But to come in and tell a bunch of people, uh, professors and 
heads of departments and uh, whatever, that we're going we're to open a, a program over in China. And uh, we're going to uh, have great ideas. We're going to be big shots, international people. Back then, the international wasn't in the forefront. People were, in 19, in case your parents or grandparents now, went to, came to the school. It was an awfully good school. But it started out as a teacher training outfit and had grown into a uh, school that had a strong school of business for just a couple of years when I got here. I got here in 74. And my predecessor, Head uh, Herb Way, had started this college over here and got a dean to get a hold of it. And, we, and he brought in some good faculty. So we really started out. But we were not for known for. You know, down in Chapel Hill, they called us Happy Happy up here. You know, we were that was up in the hills, uh, Tweetsie, U.S. U.N.C. Tweetsie. Uh, we were on the fringes up here, but we had developed a program, had been the best college of education in the, in the state. There was no question that we always had that, and we had good solid leadership up here. But you had to bring them along. You're going to find that out. So as we go through this, take a look at the times, the things that are mentioned about how this is going to, to work, what's in it for you. Uh, give me the next one. You do. Based on the observations to date, I have written to Dr. Woods and told him that we would still maintain an interest in the proposal, and I would now want to know if there's enough interest in the project among the faculty to pull together the 100 to 300 volumes needed to be transferred to Chinese universities to continue further exploration. That's so why we will tell you, we, they were poor as church mice over there. They, uh, what they call the grand experiment over there. The red troops came in and burned yeah. the libraries down. They'd gone through all of this and they rich, but they were poorer than we were. So this came out, Mark actually, I think, is the one that popped this idea to us. He said, to get the faculty involved in this, why not ask if they would be willing for book, to give books? And we're going to show you we started up a, a program of smuggling <laughs> to get stuff to them. Uh, but this gave time, again, look at the dates, this gave time to talk to the faculty or to your you're going to step in someplace when you leave here. They're going to say, you're an Appalachian State graduate. Uh, you, you're going to come in and we're going to change things here. You're, going to, you're expected to change in our little department here. And you're going to have to bring the whole organization ahead. And you've got to make sure that everybody, you don't want to be the leader that's out there and looking around every now and then no one's following you. So you've got to learn how to get them along. This was a good idea. Uh, we not only, they not only had enough interest in doing this, uh, they really excelled. The faculty at the university like this, particularly this faculty, very generous about their books. We, we gathered up 300 books in no time. And the, the uh, ASU Foundation paid for it and we shipped them over there. It hit me with Uh, it would have to be made clear any donor of books that a, even after the books are sent, there's a possibility that no exchange would come about. As this will simply permit us to proceed further to see if the agreement can be reached. This was aimed at the professors in the biology department and in the chemistry department, English department, who was saying, who's paying for all this? Is it going to hurt our programs when you get your job? first job, you come up with the first idea, the first question, your good friend in the, the journey booth is going to ask is, it's not going to take any of my money, is it? It's not going to take any of my money, is it? We had to say then that we're still working this problem, and, and we did, we were working hard, but that's, that's the reason this sort of thing hit me again to see the 
Oh no, this is this is a memorandum. This is a memo from Dr. Ken Connolly. He was the president of Northeast Institute. It says to the Chancellor, it's not. It was this really the misprint here. That goes to our counterparts over there in, in China, the, the man and woman who were working. <coughs> but the reason uh, this was important to, that I needed to show it to you is that uh, on September 24, 1980, Appalachian State University's bid had gotten through Beijing. Nothing happens in China, I mean, even now. It's a purely a top-down management tier over there. Penalties for getting out of line. So if Beijing doesn't sprinkle holy water on it, it doesn't grow. But we've gotten that, so it's a major, major thing. We got it, and we breathed a sigh of relief. Okay, show me the next one. Uh, this is his letter. And this is a letter that uh, he sent to me. This one did come to me in October. At the invitation of our institute, Northeast, Dr. and Mrs. Donaldson Woods came to our institute to present lectures from September 19. We were pleased that our faculty received great benefit from their conscientious instruction and amiable manner. <coughs> During their stay, we mutually exchanged views in regard to establishing exchange programs between our institute and interest, interested universities in the USA. This, again, was uh, vitally important to me, to, re to us, to read that Kong had invited these armed people over there, our old professor from ASU, over and they had gone through this session with him. And it's, it was important. Let me, see, let me see if I've got anything more on this one. That's it, go ahead and hit me. Uh, this was the tail end of the letter here. This is pure Chinese now. But we, uh, the letter was effusive to me from the president over there. He got to the end of it, he said, <clears throat> talking about Woods, they are in no way agents or officials of the PRC, the People's Republic of China, but are citizens of the U.S. who desire to promote bonds of friendships between U.S. in order to realize our objectives, establish programs with much pleasure. He, that was for Beijing's benefit to say that sure enough, we, we're going to negotiate with that little school in the mountains. But we want to put it on paper that we're dealing here not in any official thing, not with these woods aren't official people. I am the chancellor over here. He wanted to make sure that we got the idea that, that it stayed in there in the Chinese line. You're still going to get this because the Chinese are uh, awfully good businessmen. One thing, <laughs> they shake hands with them, to count your fingers because they know how to make a buck and they know how to. And, and I'm not. I'd say it with them sitting here, friends of mine, uh, that they that even even to the count your fingers things because they got sense of humor. But they really are watching out for the, their national interests. And, and you learn <coughs> that in working the many, many years we've been there. And I'm, I'm awfully proud of you <laughs> that the students have done an awful lot over there. I've, I've watched it, hardly watched it, below these 20 some years, back even before. Uh, and dedicated students have helped to establish the fact that. Appalachian means what they say. We've never promised them anything that we didn't deliver. And we made sure that it was tit for tat. They gave us something. We honored them, gave them respect. Uh, as I say, you're dealing from strength now, but you built that strength. Worth it. Let's see. Okay, this was the we're coming near the end of the time. Woods was telling most of Woods' letter to me. This was from Woods to me in September of 1980. Uh, most of his letters to me were to encourage me to keep to 
keep working on this thing because it was time consuming. And it's, uh, as you find out from all your professors here, it takes a lot of time to sit down and work out deals that, that are honest packages of things. So here's, here's his wish at me. We do not wish to underestimate the fact that our faculty members and students are going to be living in a nation with different historical, cultural, and political roots and values. There also would be some adjustments in terms of living conditions and diet. That is the understatement of the year. <laughs> the people who have been to China will say it now, back, back uh, 35 years ago, even more so. Uh, there was no McDonald's over there. And every time you came back, you came back with mouths root dreams. Yeah, okay, yeah <laughs> that's right. You had to be careful. And we had students now. There hadn't been any further east than deep camp, you know. And, and, and faculty that really were cutting their teeth from going to a place, let alone China. It's all right to go to England, to go to France, Mexico, even. The language not do that bad. Chinese language is difficult to learn, but the culture is really, really different. And uh, now you uh, learn a lot about it. That's one reason that old man's getting up here talking about it. I just remind you, you already know this. Go ahead and hit me in the road. This one's important to put up here before you. Uh, this begins Wood's letter to me, telling me, let's do it. And uh, Tell me he certainly thinks it's going to be a Listen to this. As you know, my grandparents and immediate family members served medical and teaching as medical and teaching personnel in China during the period 1896 to 1940. 1940. Their influence, of course, has remained with us, and we feel that close ties of mutual friendship and sharing are indispensable between our two nations. Now that's Woods talking. He really was that because of his grandparents had been over there as missionaries for all those years. 1940, you know, is the beginning of the Second World War. They were there, the Chinese big turmoil started in 1940. Know that. But anyway, that's the last time anybody had been in Xinjiang that was American. 1940, by the time we got there in 1981, 41 years. But the important thing of having this in front of me is this, that the Chinese, when they come up to you and shake your hand and talk to you, are trying to establish warm personal friendships, mutual trust and mutual responsibility. And if you know that, when you're dealing, even if you're dealing about who's going to pay for the pencils and paper, Thing. Remember that they're saying, <clears throat> I'm not just looking at any old American that's come in here. I'm looking at a friend, a potential friend here. Would he, will he come through with the pencils? Uh, will she not gossip about me? Will she be trustworthy? And you got to prove it. Uh, and once you do, and, and with us, with no problem. Well, most of us don't go to the on our shore. But with us, really, we want to be put our best foot forward. So that's probably hit me again. Pictures from China. This, this is one. Let me show the first one here. We're going to go into his presentation here. Click that and see if I can see. This, these are beautiful park places. And again, this isn't just standing up here with two old men saying, uh, This was my last year's summer's vacation. Here's some beautiful slides. These are places that you have seen, or will see, and you're going to see them in changed, much changes. But, but you're going to be wealthier after Durham shows you what they looked like 35 years ago, and you're caught up in this rapid change now. One thing I haven't mentioned here is one reason that I think it's important that you talk to the old men. Communication. Uh, you know, you're an entirely different era of young American students in terms of communication. You, you communicate with right up-to-date stuff, you've got your, your iPads, and your 
don't, don't so really call them now. That, that's not my field. But are you better off? We think so. Than you would have been if you didn't have it. Your, your communications now, are, you can have it instantaneously. We're hardly worked, worked for four weeks to get drafts of letters and stuff put together. You can sit down and ding, 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 and instantaneously every chairman of every department and everyone coming down to the janitor is on, on copy and this is what we're going to do. And that's great. And, and that's the way you operate. You're going to get ulcers if you, if you don't watch yourself because the, the, the back side of that is people are beginning to expect that you, since you get an e email, that they look for your answer out like that. And that's tough. I mean, times now, as a new manager, you're going to have to say, yeah, give me a couple of days on that. Uh, I want time to think. And if you don't, if you just start shooting from the hip, you won't survive. Let me turn this over to Dr. Durham now. And he, uh, he will pick it up and pay attention to some of the dates and some of the pictures that you see. I think you'll find them of interest. All right, can you pick it up? slideshow here about pictures and stuff. But I wanted to show you just a few kind of curiosities. One of the things at Northeast University, uh, Northeast University of Technology, NUT, uh, when I was there, they gave, for some reason, they gave us these little medallions. And they were apparently made in 1950, but they had developed a way to perfume these metal objects. And now this was 1950, it's got the date 50 on 1950. And uh, I rather suspect that's when they made them, but that perfume exists to the day. What's that, 65 years? Yeah. 65 years, I guess. Uh, some of the things that interested me, we went to uh, what they call a feather factory, and uh, they had these pictures. They make, they make these pictures out of nothing but feathers. And they gave, and also seashells, everything in this picture is a seashell, everything in this one is a feather. But they gave the chancellor, I guess it's around someplace, they gave him one that he could not pack up, but yet had to carry on the plane every place we went coming back. I can remember that picture being stuffed in, in between our feet and the seats in front of us. Wasn't it pretty sight? It was three, it was about three feet by two feet. It was this huge thing they gave him. I don't know how in the world they thought he was going to carry that thing. And then one other thing, before we, before we went, there were, there were a lot of customs that we had to familiarize our, ourselves with, and you all are probably uh, being steeped in some of those before you go, so you don't make a misstep with somebody. We, we were told, and it was true, that they would not accept gratuities. And, and when we did arrive, that we, we wanted to bring some things that, that were just, just a token of our, show a token of our appreciation for our drivers, maybe for waiters, people who did things for us there at the university. So we loaded up about 50 of these little uh, flashlights. Still work. I do take the batteries out of them every year. You do? Yeah, that's what they <laughs> no, they still work. So, do they, uh, so we had about 50 of these and we passed them out. But if you gave them, if you gave them something uh, of some value, they would have to turn it over to the party officials. It, that would go to the, to the party and some high ranking party official would end up with the things that we had really intended uh, for them to have. Uh, one other sort of curiosity too, uh, these are some Christmas cards and New Year's cards that they sent. There's one with a rather angry looking bird on it. That looks something like Hansel and Gretel in a house that looks sort of like a Christmas tree. And uh, but, then, but then there was an evolution of these cards that, that got me. I finally, this went on for a number of years, and uh, I noticed the card started out by Dr. Durham, and then it has something in Chinese, and this is signed by uh, Vice President Su, who, who's the Vice President there, and uh, a card that said, uh, Dear Dr. Durham, I think this one is, 
uh, Dear Dr. Harvey Durham, and uh, and then that progressed to doc, just Dr. Durham, best wishes. And then from there we went to Dear Durham, and then the next one is Dear Vice President Durham Sins. <laughs> I, I don't know where they got that sense from. I guess somebody must have written down or told somebody, Dr. Durham sends his regards. And so they heard Dr. Dur Durham sends, and then it got to be Durham sends. And then from there we went to Dear Mr. Sins. <laughs> and Dear Mr. Sins. <laughs> so by the end of our, our, sojour our journey with China over several years, this went over years. I became Dr. Sin, so I'll just show those two. Those are all Christmas cards, New Year's cards. Just kind of a curiosity. Uh, but I did want to, I want to talk to you a little bit about the agreement that, that we did around that. And the things that, that, that Don Woods had to say about the, the political values, uh, intrinsic values that the people had, the diet was somewhat different. That, as he said, that was the understatement of the decade or the century, as far as I could, I'm concerned. Because those things did uh, much of that did shape the uh, negotiations that we went through. Director Lau. He, he was with us all the time that we were in China. He's a party guy. And I never could, I never did know exactly what Dr. <laughs> Director Lau did, other than he was with the party and he, he took care of everything for us. He was with us the whole time. Uh, in, in fact, when they came to visit us, I guess in 82 was their first visit here. They came to visit us in 82. Uh, he and I spoke a common language, and that was the language of the budget. He, he did the budgets for them, and I did the budgets for us, and we had to, to get together because it was costing them a lot more money than they thought it was. The guy in the foreground, though, that's the infamous Donaldson Woods. Now, on the plane, John, did you, did you sit with him on the plane in no. China? Well, he... I know I was sitting with Mark Williams. He was sitting on one side of the plane. Don Woods was in the other side of the plane about midway through. And he, he was just getting accustomed to speaking Chinese. And he had everybody behind him up listening to what he had to say. And they would laugh. And everybody in front of him would turn around. And they would laugh. And, and, and everybody was just having a good time. And all of a sudden, everything got real quiet. And I said, Marv, what did he just say? <laughs> He said, well, he meant to say, I'm afraid my Chinese is not very good. But what he said was, when I speak Chinese, I, I am afraid. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you a little bit more about, about uh, Don Woods in just, in just a moment or two. But I guess from that, that then, I, what he was saying uh, in speaking China, Chinese, uh, obviously in America, I heard an expression, I wish I could do it. Chinese, but I can't. But the expression goes something like this. I fear nothing in the heavens. I fear nothing on earth. I fear only a foreign devil speaking Chinese. I see that you're nodding you before you heard that expression. So I don't know how much Chinese you've learned, but uh, they may have something else on their on their mind when you're saying it. Oh, something else too. When, when we, the first day we were in Xinjiang, uh, the night of that day that we arrived, they gave a banquet for me. We had you know, numerous banquets to go to. But I had to stand up and say a few words, and I had no concept of Chinese humor. I didn't know if they thought the things that we thought funny would be funny to them. And so I can't, I can't do the correct pronunciation, but you know, in Chinese, you can have the same two characters having two different meanings, depending on the intonation when you say the word. So the, the word for fat chicken, or the symbols for fat chicken in an airplane are exactly the same. One is pronounced Fiji, and that was Fiji, some, something like that. And so I, I got up when it came my turn to say a few words at the bank, but I told him I didn't know when we, when we left uh, Guangzhou whether or not we were going to be flying on an airplane or a fat chicken. 
<laughs> which had gotten the tickets for us. <laughs> so, so they did laugh. They thought that was funny. And years after that, I guess I made my last trip to China in, in 1999, but that was the Fudan. But of those three visits that I made to Northeast University of Technology, somebody would come up to me and say, fat chicken. <laughs> to me. So, gee, we could, I couldn't say a word Chinese, really. I knew a little bit. But uh, we did have that in common. So they, they, they did remember that story. Uh, that's just where we landed. Uh, well, that was another thing too. That there was no food on these these flights. Now, you, if you flew flew on the flights with a cadre, if you didn't go with a foreign visitor's uh, airplane, the foreign the foreign visitor's airplane. They had food, but in these planes they had no galley whatsoever. The galley was just, it was, it was not clean at all. And so we would stop and have a meal and then get back on the plane and fly again. <laughs> when we flew into Beijing, I swear there went more than three or four planes in the whole place at that time. And of course, I, I imagine it's just full of planes. Now, so, and I guess the point, of, one of the points I'm making is that the China that, that you're seeing a little bit about tonight that China doesn't exist anymore. And you'll see that, pay particular attention to the street scenes when I show those to you, because those street scenes are not going to be anything like what you what you want to see on these. Let's see. Yeah, the first the first place we the part, first place we stopped, that's the American Embassy in China, in Beijing. That we decided that we'd better go check in at the embassy to let somebody know what our itinerary was and where we were going to be in China. So from there, though, we went on to Xinjiang. Okay, now this is, uh, Robin, this is Donaldson Woods here, and that's his wife, Charlene, is that? Charlene. Charlene, I'm sorry. And these are all students from NEUT. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard, there used to be a news broadcaster, Paul Harvey who would give some intros and then he'd say, and now for the rest of the story. Okay, well the Chancellor has showed you all these memoranda, letters and things that we had to get this program going and the planning that had to go on for it. But then how, how did we really get involved with Northeast University? Well, it was through Donaldson Woods, but it was a smuggling operation. They had, they had computers in China, but they didn't have the parts to fix them when something happened to them. So all these students from NEUT, these are students from NEUT, they would come down uh, and see Don Woods. He was at, he was at Hong Kong Tech, Technology, yeah. University, Tech, Technological University, or whatever. And uh, he would get these computer parts for them. He probably liberated them. I didn't know he died. He probably liberated those parts. He'd give them the parts and they would smuggle them back into China. And so that's really how the operation uh, came about. And there's one more smuggling operation that we'll talk about next but that's the real, that was the way that we really got into China. I guess what I mean. Now, all over China, I guess it's still there, are the ubiquitous statues of him. I'll give you some idea how big that freeze is. I think it's statues that Don Woods again standing. I think I took that one out of my the, uh, hotel room that we were staying in. And, uh, this particular one, as you go in the gates of Fudan University, as you go through the gates, you'll see this particular statue. And uh, this was one of the things that we came to. There's a picture in some other. These are the gates. These are the gates to the university. And if you look right in the middle, you'll see that statue of the chairman standing there. Okay, so now we come to the negotiating part. I guess the, the first day we showed up, uh, there were the three of us, the Chancellor and Mark Williamson and I, and we went into this room, and there were about 40 or 50 people sitting in it. And I thought, we cannot negotiate this. <laughs> 